Hi guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Judy Cho and I am a nutritional therapy practitioner. I have a private practice where I work with clients to get to root cause healing. And oftentimes that requires a meat-based elimination diet and doing a lot of gut healing. Today's episode is sponsored by Carnivore Cure. If you are following a meat-based diet and have questions, or if you want to share some of the science with your friends and family, or just want to understand a little more, make sure to check out Carnivore Cure. It has over 150 colored graphics and resources that you can always turn to. There are also over 10 bonus guides that you can download following the URLs that are in the book. All right, so let's get right into this episode. Today, I had the pleasure of interviewing Miss Mary Fields. I'll let her introduce herself, but she has done so much healing in her 70s eating a meat-based diet, and it just shows you that it is never too late to start. Let's get right into the interview. So hi, Mary. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you can introduce yourself and tell the people listening and watching watching a little bit about your journey and what brought you to a carnivorous journey? Gosh, I think my story is pretty typical from most people that end up on a journey. I started out very young in life with an eating disorder. Of course, I had no idea at the time that's what it was. I called it feast or famine. I became very self-conscious about my appearance. Uh, I had two sisters that were really skinny. And so, you know, I thought I was fat. Other people thought I was fat and I became very self-conscious about it. So I started trying to diet pretty early in life. And um, the only way I could lose weight was to starve myself, which I did. I did that for a long time. At one time I got hooked on diet pills and uh, it, it was just a nightmare. And when I was, I guess my late thirties, early forties, I started developing a lot of health issues uh, I had eczema really bad, uh, starting really when I was about 10 or 11. And that just persisted uh, for my whole life. At one time, I had eczema over 75% of my body, and the doctor actually wanted to admit me to the hospital. It was really bad around my neck, and it was swollen, and they were afraid it was going to cut off my airways. And Wow. So I ended up, instead of going to the hospital, taking some a steroid shot. <laughs> because I I didn't want to go to the hospital. So the eczema was really bad. A lot of allergies, like pollen allergies. And I started developing food allergies. And over time, it just, what I could eat just got smaller and smaller. I learned about lictins. I learned about phytic acid and uh, nightshades. And so, uh, you know, I just kept limiting what I could eat. I got very radical about eating organic And of course, I I was vegetarian, then I was vegan, then I went back to being vegetarian. I rarely ever ate meat. I had read the China Report, and I believed that if I ate meat, my body was going to be very acidic, and I would uh, be subject to cancer and other diseases. So it's pretty unusual. I ate uh, chicken occasionally. I would eat eggs, and I stayed away from milk products because I was lactose intolerant. And I, I was really starting from a very young age, I had what I would say now was IBS. I either was very constipated or I had terrible diarrhea where I had to go to the doctor and get shots. And um, my stomach was always bloated. I always had a really big stomach. It was bloated and I had stomach pain all the time. I, I just don't remember eating and being able to have a nice meal and, you know, not have my stomach blow up like a balloon and hurt. So that was pretty much what I had lived with all of my life. And then as I got older, I developed arthritis. I developed um, really serious hypertension. At one point, my average blood pressure was 169 over 90. And it went up from there. And at one point, I remember one time I went to the dentist and they took my blood pressure and it was 240 over 130. The dentist just turned as white as a sheet. He was like, go to the ER right now which of course I didn't. I went home and uh, prayed and got some lavender out and called my friends. And after a while I calmed down and my blood pressure went down, but I did have chronic and persistent hypertension that finally had to be treated with medication. And at one time I was on three medications for hypertension. 
So, and had an irregular heart and, you know, you just, as you get older, <laughs> stuff can happen. <laughs> and I was really discouraged because I thought, you know what? I have, I have invested so much in my health. I mean, literally, I would say, try not to exaggerate, for at least 35 years, I studied everything I could find about nutrition. You know, at the beginning, it was Adele Davis, which you probably never heard of. She ended up dying of cancer. And I didn't know about Weston Price. I didn't, you know, I didn't have the resources to, to find out about him. Then I followed Maureen Solomon, and she came out with a book, and that was kind of my reference for what to do. And I, I subscribed to nutrition action. I couldn't wait to get my, my little magazine every month. And then when I finally started getting on the web, I, I began to really look into it. And then I ended up uh, doing a degree program in uh, organizational leadership that required writing a thesis. So I wrote an undergraduate thesis doing a correlation study between diet and depression. And that was in 1999. And they're really, I mean, it was just, considered to be a really wild idea that there could be any relationship between the two. I knew it was true because I had suffered from depression all of my life. It was never diagnosed. I was never treated for it, but um, I, I obviously presented with all the classic symptoms of, of um, chronic depression. So I was able to overcome a lot of that just by getting off of sugar. I got off sugar about 25 years ago. Then I got off of gluten and so on. And uh, so, you know, I got discouraged. I thought, wait a minute, you know, I ended up in the hospital with AFib. They only kept me for about 24 hours. And of course, they ran all these tests on me. And the nurse came in and he said, in 10 years of practice, I have never seen a patient your age as healthy as you are. And he said, most people your age are, are half your age are not this healthy. And I'm lying there in the hospital and I'm thinking, okay, they think I'm healthy. I'm presenting with eczema, uh, pollen allergies, arthritis, hypertension, because I was still on meds at that point. This was a, a year ago. Last, oh. This was in January of 2020. Um, what else? Uh, of course, all my digestive issues. And I thought those are all inflammation markers. And if this is healthy, then we have a problem <laughs> because I don't consider myself healthy. You know, I don't feel good all the time. And I've got all this stuff I'm dealing with constantly. So um, my daughter said to me one day, this was prior to me ending up in the hospital. She said, um, mom, you know, there are people out there that all they do is eat meat. And I was just stunned. I mean, my jaw hit the floor. I was like, are you serious? That is really dangerous. I can't believe somebody would do that. And she said, no, I've been following them. Uh, Sean Baker, and I don't remember, um, there's a, who's the nutrition or the physician in Nashville that is? Oh, Dr. Ken Berry. Dr. Ken Berry. And so uh, she said, why don't you just go on the web and check it out? So I, I did. I got on YouTube and I just started I, for about three weeks. I watched videos. That's how I found out about you. I started following you before I ever did carnivore. <laughs> I don't think I could have done this without you. <laughs> oh gosh. So anyway, I started listening and I thought, you know what? There might be something to this. So um, I had, I, of course, I'd heard about keto. I was totally unwilling to do keto. I was done. I mean, I'm 78 years old. That's wow. I'm you're done now. Really good. I thought you were in your young 70s. Wow. Okay. No, I'm 78. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not measuring anything. I don't know what macros <laughs> and micros are. And I don't even care. Right. And I'm not doing it. But I thought maybe I could just go low carb. So at the time I got admitted into the hospital for that one little less than 24 hour session for the AFib, um, I was down to about 30 carbs a day. Okay. And I've been doing that for maybe three weeks. So uh, I got home from the hospital and I thought, I'm doing carnivore. I'm going to try it for three months and just see what happens. I had all this expensive food in my freezer and, you know, in my pantry. And uh, I had a friend that I, like I did, 
before I did carnivore and I gave it all away to her hundreds of dollars worth. She was thrilled. And uh, I went down to a local um, farmer who, a rancher and started buying my meat and wow, (laughs) it was, I mean, I couldn't believe it. I, the first time I bit into a steak, I was like, Oh, my body was like, thank you. You're finally getting it right. (laughs) And for about three months, I just craved red meat. That's all I ate. So prior to the three months, were you not eating any red meat? Were you just eating that chicken? Wow. If I ate meat at all, if I ate meat at all, I was eating chicken. Wow. Yeah. No, I was not eating red meat. Certainly not pork. I love bacon. <laughs> I eat bacon every day now. But um, no, I wasn't. And my body was just so responsive. I could not believe I was starving, literally starving. And I was overweight with from 19 or from 20, uh, 29, starting about a year before 2020. Oh, maybe a little farther than a year over, I gained 30 pounds and I could not explain it. I did not have a clue why I was gaining weight. I, I you know, I wasn't overeating sure. and I certainly wasn't eating junk food or, or the standard American diet or any of that. So um, I just couldn't figure out what was going on. And one of the reasons I was motivated to do carnivore is because I wanted to lose weight which of course that didn't happen <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> it finally started. I lost five pounds the first two weeks and gained all of it back. And I wasn't doing anything except just eating the meat. And so I realized very early on in my carnivore journey that this was not about weight loss. Yeah. Oh, you know, right. that my body was going to find the ideal weight for me and that I just had to just wait. And I learned a lot of that from you and from other people that I watched that, you know, you're going to lose some weight eventually. I mean, I, I had 30 pounds to lose, which is very different from somebody that's got 150 pounds to lose. Exactly. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about your journey. So the first three months, um, what were you eating? How were you eating? And then how has it changed? And then let's a little bit about the weight loss as well. So initially you lost five pounds, then you didn't lose anything, which is actually very common when there's not a lot of weight to lose. I think some of it is your hormones are rebalancing. It's finally feeling like your body's getting fed. And so there's a lack of weight loss. And I see a lot of people getting frustrated, especially when the diet is kind of sold as a weight loss magic pill. So if you can talk a little bit about dietary changes from the very beginning of carnivore until now, and then your weight loss journey in it, and then what kept you going, even though you weren't necessarily losing the weight initially. Okay. When I first started, I ate red meat exclusively. That was really all I wanted. And I would say I did that for the it, pretty much. I, I don't remember when I introduced bacon, but nothing sounded good to me. I tried to eat some chicken. It, I didn't even have any taste to me. And uh, so really for the first three months, I ate uh, red meat, I, mostly steak. I ate a lot of ground beef and, uh, and steak. I ate a steak every day, usually a ribeye. And I ate about two pounds, two pounds of meat a day for about three months. And it was, it, I've never, I mean, I've never wished I could have a chocolate sundae or, you know, a a peanut butter sandwich or any of that. I mean, I got over that a long, long time ago because I just very gradually weaned myself off of all of that stuff and, and just, and through, you know, a lot of work overcame my habit of overeating. So I had already been down that road and conquered that. So, uh, but all I wanted was red meat. I didn't want anything else to eat except steak and red meat and about two pounds a day. I wasn't eating a lot of fat. I was still not convinced that fat would not make you fat. (laughs) And I didn't feel well the first three months were really hard for me. The first couple of weeks I felt great. And then I started getting what I think was probably the keto flu. Um, And I didn't have a lot of energy. I was still having some digestive issues. Uh, Now the hypertension went away very quickly within a matter of about six weeks. I was completely off of the last of the medications I was on. 
So uh, that, that was really good. And there were other things. The eczema started going away very quickly. Uh, but I was still having digestive issues, and I didn't have a lot of energy, and I didn't feel well. I had diarrhea a lot. Uh, so then I found out from you, I was watching one of your videos, and I found out about the HCL. And I, I immediately went, and I drink alkaline water, and it, I just thought maybe – I, my gut is really alkalinized from all the water I'm drinking and I'm not digesting things well because I don't have enough stomach acid. So I got the HCL and that stopped the diarrhea immediately. Mm -hmm. And then I went on to add um, the sporebiotics and the IgG2. I just added the IgG2000 recently. And of course I take a digestive enzyme. So uh, the whole, you know, the whole journey of getting my gut healed is still in process, but it's a lot better. Once I was ready to quit at three months, mm. I just thought, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't feel good. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I, I do have a coach. So I, I had a call with my coach right before my three month marker. And she said, you're really doing great. <laughs> And she said, if you'll just hang in there right around three months, you start feeling better. And sure enough, I did. It was just kind of suddenly right around, right. I just had stepped over my three months and suddenly I did start feeling better. And um, I started adding other things back into my diet. Uh, really for the first six or seven months, mostly what I ate was red meat and primarily steaks, but I don't do that anymore. I rarely ever eat steaks. I had a steak today for lunch, but I have this little medley of meat that I mix up. I take a, a pound of ground lamb and I get all my meat from a, a local rancher here. So it's all grass fed and pastured and so on. But I do a pound of ground lamb, a pound of ground pork and two pounds of ground meat. And I just mix it all up together. Like I was going to make, cook it like you're going to make spaghetti sauce. Sure. And um, I, I just dish that up. I'll add some water and a couple of tablespoons of butter and a little more salt and then add the meat. And it makes this really delicious broth, which I love. And uh, so I drink the broth and eat the meat. And I do that for, for breakfast and lunch. And then at dinner, I have eggs and bacon. And I just started eating eggs again about two months ago. I never, the eggs just didn't even sound good. I, I, and so I didn't eat them. But after I, um, after I broke my hip and went through the surgery, my appetite changed and I started craving eggs. So I eat eggs and bacon for break, for dinner at night. And that's what I eat. And then every once in a while I have a steak. And or that's good. I mean, you're eating a variety and, you know, I did a blog post not too long ago about how pork and, how egg yolks and all of these other foods have different nutrition. And so it's good long-term as you're healing. Like it sounds like you went through this process of healing and you were use, eating a lot of red meat and that's fine. And then as you are making it more of a lifestyle, then you should include other meat. So that's really good. Um, and then you're adding more fat. And so when you are, you know, cooking all that meat and all that fat that's coming out of it for you to drink it, like these are all things that are really beneficial for your hormones and balancing just your overall energy because I always tell my clients, but you either get your energy from uh, proteins that then um, break down into uh, sugars uh, or you get it from the fat. So if you eat a more fat, you will get more energy that way. And then you don't have to have the proteins all break down to amino acids to then, you know, use as energy. So it sounds like you've done a lot of healing. Do you still eat the two pounds? Um, no. Okay. No. <laughs> no. You can't keep doing that. You know, at first my body was just so starved for the nutrition, but no, I eat about a pound of meat a day. Okay. Sometimes a little over a pound. I don't really measure it, but when I make my 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 ground meat mixture, that's four pounds, and it'll last me four days. Okay. So. Yeah. I don't, you know, I thought you don't need as much meat when you're eating more fat. And I had to add the fat in because I started having hot flashes mm. at yes. 70. I'm like, Wait a minute. I had menopause like 30 years ago. And what is this about? So uh, my coach told me, she said, you really need to add the fat back in, put your in. Of course, I've also learned from you that you need about about 70 to 80% of my calories need to be in fat. And I don't know if that's true or not. I eat about 
probably seven or eight tablespoons of fat a day, maybe a little bit more. So you don't, you know, you don't need a lot of meat to go with that. No, I, I agree. I mean, if you think about it, seven to eight tablespoons of fat is about 700 to 800 calories. And then if you were to eat the same amount of protein, then you would be probably gaining a lot of weight because it increases the calories by a lot. And so it makes sense. That's about the similar amount I eat. So I eat probably about a pound a day and I used to eat two pounds. And then when I started introducing all that fat, I didn't need it. And it's, it's wild because your energies are better, right? Even though you're eating all this fat, you would think the fat kind of weighs you down. But if your digestive health is good, your um, even eating all that fat actually gives you more energy. The sleep is better. I'm sure you don't get the hot flashes now, right? No. <laughs> yeah. So and I like- sleep really well. I mean, which is really, you know, I, I think there is something to the fact that when we get older, we don't sleep as well. Uh, but, and I didn't. Prior to being carnivore, I was up probably three or four times a night going to the bathroom. Now, part of that was the blood pressure because, you know, your kidneys are always trying to help you to balance out your blood pressure. So, uh, you know, that doesn't happen anymore. I mean, I drink a lot of water before I go to bed. You know, whether that's smart or not, I don't know, but I happen to be thirsty. So sometimes I'll drink over a liter of water before I go to bed. So I usually have to get up. Uh, once at night and go to the bathroom just because I drank a lot of water, but I sleep really, really well. And I'm, I'm very thankful for that. That makes a huge difference when you're rested. Right. I mean, you do most of your detoxing while you're sleeping. Um, it balances your cortisol level. So it's really important. And it's funny because you're talking about all the things I have to kind of drill into my clients is you need to add the fat so you can sleep. You need to work on your gut so you can um, you know, digest the fat and you need to probably eat less protein. So you're not having like the hot flashes or having like a cortisol spike in the middle of the night. And it sounds like you've done a lot of that on your own. And so that's amazing. And I love that you're sharing that even though after three months in, you were kind of exhausted and even not gaining, losing the weight and you still didn't give up. And now you're seeing a lot of the benefits and it's making it all worthwhile, which is huge. Um, so what, what about the wet weight loss journey? Has it just kind of stabilized? Like where, where are you on that? Well, I didn't lose any weight really until I was about six months in. Now, the good news was I had stopped gaining weight because prior to that, starting about late 2019 to 2020, I mean, every time I got on the scales, my weight had gone up. So I went from a size 12 to a, a tight 16 you know, you have to lay down on the bed and hold your breath and get the pliers to zip up your pants, <laughs> your jeans. That's kind of where I was on the size 16. And I was like, oh boy, this has got to stop. So the good news was I stopped gaining weight. And here's what's really interesting. Even though I wasn't losing any weight, my body started getting smaller. So over a period, I, I hit my one year mark on February the 2nd. And uh, I had lost a little over 18 pounds. So, but, but I weigh 10 pounds. I'm a size 12, which is what I weighed when I was 10 or 11 pounds lighter than I am now. So even though the scales are not reflecting a total weight loss, I've gone back down to a size 12, which is a good size for me. I'm, I'm a big person. I've got big bones and, you know, I, I'm my, my uh, younger sister we can be the same size and she can weigh uh, 15 pounds less than I do because I, I you know, I have a larger structure. So um, I'm back down to a size 12, even though my weight is not down to where it was before I started gaining weight. And that makes sense. Um, especially if you even had a um, hip surgery to me, oftentimes the reason why we, um, you know, break our hip bone is because we don't have enough muscle there to protect us when we fall. And so as you are eating more meat and the fact that you were craving so much red meat, it's probably your body was kind of deficient in proteins. And so as you are healing your body, you're probably adding a lot of uh, protein and lean body mass on your body, which is great. It's so wonderful. Um, That's what we need for longevity. And so even though you're leaning out, you're almost not, you're probably building muscle and that's why you're not 
changing on the way scale, but even though your clothes and your body is actually getting smaller and that's, that's what we want. So yes. Yeah. That's, um, that's, that's wonderful. And so do you plan on eating this way long-term? Do you add, um, cons- are you planning on, you know, adding more diversity? What's, what are your kind of thoughts now that you've passed your one year mark and happy one year? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, I don't see myself coming off of carnivore. I really don't. Uh, it's so easy. And I really enjoy my food. I know for somebody who's probably never done carnivore or thought about it, it would sound very boring, but it's not. You know, I mean, I, everything tastes good and it's easy. And uh, of course, my health is so much better. I don't have the eczema anymore. Zero. No eczema. Oh, wow. No eczema. Huge. That is a miracle. <laughs> I mean, you have no idea. I mean, eczema can drive you crazy because you're always itching and it'll keep you up at night. It's terrible. So for the first time since I was about 11 years old, I do not have any eczema. Wow. And I'm not having digestive issues anymore. My stomach doesn't stick out like it used to. I mean, I still have a stomach. But, you know, I'm not all bloated like I used to be. And, uh, of course, the hypertension's gone. And uh, there's just, there's a list of, I have a list of things. It's hard to remember everything that was wrong <laughs> when you first started. You know what's really funny is um, I'll work with clients and they heal the sleep, they heal the mood, they heal all these things. And then the one last thing will be the weight. It'll kind of just be there. And then they're like, I'm not losing the weight. And then they get really frustrated. And so that was part of the reason why I would take notes in the beginning. And so we would go back to the first session and there's all these things that they've healed. And then they're, and then they'll be like, Oh my gosh, I forgot that I would, you know, because when you start getting used to the new normal and you forget how much you've healed. So what have you healed in total? If you have that list with you, I don't need hormone clean, cream anymore. Oh, so you used to use, use hormone cream. Oh, yes. Vegestrin cream. So how long were you using that? Years. Oh, years. Wow. So nothing. I, I don't think my hormones have ever been properly balanced. I think this may be the first time they're actually coming into balance. And One of the things that I've noticed is that my body temperature went up. I was always cold. Mm. And uh, even though I was overweight, I was cold. And my body temperature started going up. So, you know, I'm not uncomfortable or anything, but I'm not, my hands aren't cold all the time and I'm not cold. Um, let me see. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. While you're looking into that, I'll, I'll explain a little bit, but it sounds like with the weight gain, you may have had some thyroid imbalances um, that also manages your, um, your temperature and also your hands being cold and stuff. So it sounds like and then even you needing the, um, the cream. So as you're healing, it sounds like your thyroid has healed somewhat. And so that's why also you were able to balance your weight again and not be gaining. One thing I'll suggest is um, take a look at taking some iodine that has helped a lot of my clients actually not have the cold hands and feet. So if you're still getting a little bit of it, you may need a, just a little bit of iodine. I did the iodine. I got the iodine and did the iodine test. It literally took almost 24 hours for all the iodine oh, to wow. fade off of my arm. Okay. And I tested it once a week for a month. And at the end of the month, it took about 12 to 15 hours for it to fade away. So that told me, because I used to take iodine. Okay. And okay. that told me that I needed to stop the iodine that I was, I think I'm getting it from the salt. Okay. Because I do use a lot of salt. I really like salt and I salt a lot. Okay. So, and you know, I will say also, because when I started carnivore, uh, I took a lot of supplements. I mean, you wouldn't believe all the supplements I took. And so what I did is I just totally eliminated everything except the magnesium and the calcium. And uh, then I just started adding things back in as, as I could tell that I needed them. So I still supplement, but not nothing like I used to. And most of it is for my gut health. I do still take magnesium. Uh, and I probably will continue to do that. I've taken it for years to help my heart regulate sure. and it's been very effective in doing that. So I'm not ready to start trying to, uh, to get off of that. Maybe sometime in the next few months, I might give it a shot and see what happens, but I do take magnesium and potassium because, uh, I was on a very high oxalate diet mm -hmm. and I've had several episodes, uh, dramatic episodes of dumping oxalates. And, uh, of course, 
the oxalates will cause your potassium to go down. Mm -hmm. So for example, when I was in the hospital, my, with the AFib, my potassium was really low. So I do supplement with potassium and magnesium and zinc in, so in the minerals. What was your, uh, what was like a, cause you know, people talk about oxalate dumping a lot. How, what was your experience with it? Oh. Oh, I just came through a, a three week episode oh. and it was really bad. I had, I had raging diarrhea, very uncomfortable diarrhea. Uh, I was very tired. I went into an, an episode of AFib, which is typical that can, well, I shouldn't say it's typical, but it's one of the, the more alarming symptoms that can happen with an AFib with a, when you're dumping oxalates. Um, and I just, I felt bad. I got a little, a uh, little bit of a skin rash on my, on my hand. It went away pretty quickly. Uh, but mostly I just didn't have any energy. I had brain fog. I, I thought, gosh, am I, you know, am I developing Alzheimer's? Because suddenly I couldn't remember something. And um, I had a lot of systemic pain. It was very uncomfortable. So you got some of the skin because you know, uh, some of the oxalate dumping, they'll have a, like the skin crystals where it looks like your skin is kind of flaking. Um, sometimes some of my clients get some of that burnt, the urine, the burning urine. Yes. Um, and then some of them, I think, get like, like you said, the brain fog, um, some headaches, uh, headaches. Some sinus, pr sinus pressure. I don't know. Sinus. Okay. Yes. And these little crystals coming out of your eyes. Oh, wow. You got that? Oh, Yeah. I had a really high oxalate diet. I mean, I've lived on almonds. I made probably the best almond butter on the planet. Of course, it was organic almonds that got soaked in salt water for 12 hours. And, you know, I thought I was doing everything right. Yeah. And I ate that every day. I ate uh, lots of nuts and seeds, sweet potatoes. I hated spinach and I ate it all the time because I thought it was good for me. I could go on and on. And uh, so it's really, I wouldn't... I, I would never recommend that somebody who's been on a high oxalate diet do what I did. Got it. In retrospect, I think it would have been a lot safer if I had known about oxalates and I could have gradually weaned myself off of what I was eating, but I didn't know. And I really think the reason I ended up in the hospital with AFib is because I had gone low carb and I had cut out a lot of that stuff for about three weeks. And I think my body was like, Oh boy, here's our big chance. <laughs> and I started dumping oxalates and it threw me into AFib. Wow. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so what about, um, what about your blood work? Have you done any blood work? Like, have you seen any improv improvements in anything else? So maybe like your CRP inflammatory marker, A1C markers, um, any of those things from prior to being carnivore and then now? I know I had a lot of blood work in the hospital that came in every day and took my blood. <laughs> I was like, Would you please stop sticking me? Cause I did fall just for the viewers. I, I took a really bad fall. I, I actually flew up in the air and all of my weight came down on my hip on a cement driveway and I broke my hip. I was just stunned. Now the, the orthopedist told my daughter that I have really good bones for someone my age. And because I was in such good health, they were able to do a procedure that they would normally do on younger people. So that helped me to recover very quickly. And I did. I had a pretty dramatic recovery. They took a lot of blood work and they did not give me any. I haven't looked at my blood work results. Okay. The last time I looked, I think I'd been on carnivore a few months whenever I had some blood work done. And the only... The only difference, because my blood work's always been really good, okay. but the only difference was that my cholesterol had gone down, which I wasn't particularly happy about because I, I feel like we need ele elevated cholesterol just because cholesterol is such an important part of our healing and, and our body. So I wasn't real happy. I, I, I Believe it or not, my cholesterol used to be about 315 okay. and it dropped down to 284. And unfortunately, it was my my HDL because my HDL was around 115 and it dropped down to 85. Oh, that's still really good. I know it's really good. But <laughs> when I came home with my blood work, my daughter said, mother, nobody has an HDL of 115. <laughs> it's not our 14. I mean, I have some clients that are in the forties for HDL 45 
And some of it's just because genetically they have lower HDL levels and they're trying to find ways to even get it to 60. So if, yeah, you're doing pretty good. Yeah. So, and you know, they looked at all my blood work and everything and ascertained that I was very healthy. So I think my triglycerides were 60. Oh, that's good. That's and uh, I don't remember my, I remember checking my A1C. This was probably months ago. And uh, I don't remember what the, what the range is, but it looked good. Well, so, I mean, if you had stopped eating sugar and grains a long time ago, then your or you know, uh, the wheat, um, your A1C probably wasn't high to begin with just because you weren't eating those types of foods anyway. It's just finding a better diet to sustain you and have an um, optimal body. So what about your family? So does your daughter do carnivore? Does your sister? <laughs> That's so it's like, oh, mom's doing another new thing. <laughs> They've been following me all these years, you know. Now they do eat healthy. Okay. And they do uh my daughter and my my son-in-law, they eat low carb oh, okay. during the week. And then they usually have one day on Sunday where they they just they, they do what they consider to be carving out. I mean, it's nothing like what most people do. Yeah. And they, you know, they they buy uh clean food, they eat organic, they eat the grass fed, pastured, everything. And uh, they buy from local farmers, even with all of the vegetables and things that they eat. So they eat very healthy. But no, they're, they're not doing carnivore. Nobody in my family is. My sisters are still hoping that I will have to I'll, I'll get off of it, I think, at some point. Maybe not. You know, I mean, they're, they're very fortunate. They can do anything they want to, and it doesn't. Now, they eat healthy, too. Everybody in my family eats healthy, pretty much. But um, they just, they were just stunned that I had reduced myself down to nothing but meat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And some people just, you know, they win the genetic lottery um, because it's funny because a lot of people will cite the Asians or the Japanese saying, hey, how come they eat a lot of rice and they're healthy or they live long or the Italians? But, you know, sometimes we're just genetically wired where we can eat a lot of carbohydrates and be OK. But a lot of us are not wired that way, too. Right. I mean, I'm Asian and I started becoming pre-diabetic, I think, in my early 30s. And so that's why I had to switch to a more meat based diet. And that made my uh, mood, my mental health extremely better. So, you know, it's just, we have to do with what we have and then find ways to better improve it. Right. And so I think that's what you're doing. Um, do you think that carnivore is for everyone? And do you think it's different for someone that's younger versus someone that's a little bit old, older? Do you think you have to do it differently? Like what is your opinion about carnivore for sort of everybody? I don't think carnivore is for everybody. I, I think every person has their own journey. And I, I, here's what I do think. I think if everybody was doing carnivore, they would be great. So, you know, having said that, I would say that, no, I don't think it's for everyone. I, I think people need to find what works best for them and that will give them the best health they can get from that based on what they're doing. I do think everybody should eat clean. And, you know, if, if I had a message out there, it would be, if, if you're not going to do anything else, just eat clean, you know, eat, uh, eat one ingredient foods like broccoli has one ingredient. It is broccoli. <laughs> a carrot is a carrot. It doesn't have a list of 17 things, most of which you cannot pronounce. Right. When I taught a health class years ago, six-year-olds or, or sixth graders, there's not a lot of difference between the two. <laughs> The six, I used to say the sixth graders are just bigger, <laughs> but um, I had them pick out their favorite fruit and bring in the label that had all the ingredients in it. And what they discovered is that a lot of times what was on, on the, on the label that, you know, was saying, this is what you're getting. When you read the ingredient label, it didn't have any of that in it, but it had all these chemicals and sugars and additives and, uh, coloring and they were just stunned they they you know they they had no idea so I think people should eat clean and I think that means that you need to eat fruits and vegetables and a lot of meat and it should be a focused meat meat based if at all possible 
Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. When they go to the grocery store, they need to read the look on the box or whatever it is you're buying and read what the ingredients are. And the, even the fact that it says organic or it says, you know, uh, vegan or whatever it is, they add all this stuff. And really, you don't even need to shop the middle of the grocery store. You can just shop the aisles and get what you need and then buy locally. But I will say this about carnivore. I think for anyone who has any kind of an autoimmune deficiency or, you know, they've got heart disease, diabetes, the, the typical things that we see now that are so common and were not common when I was growing up. I mean, rarely did people have heart disease or certainly not diabetes. And if they did, it was type one. Right. There was, I mean, we didn't even have a type two diabetes. It just, I mean, I've been in medicine off and on for 50 years. I was married to a doctor. So, you know, I've kind of followed this whole health story. And so for anybody who's suffering from things like that, I think they should definitely do carnivore. And I'm not saying don't commit for your life. In fact, I think anytime you're going to start a protocol like this, you need to take it one day at a time and just, you know, make a commitment for I'm going to do this, I would say for three months. And then at the end of the three months, based on, how you're feeling and uh, uh, where you think you want to go with this. And you can maybe start adding things back in. I think, I think that's a great um, approach. And I think that's the right way. I think instead of thinking, okay, I'm going to look like this, or my goals are this, instead of just, I'm going to try this three months is a good amount of time to try kind of anything new and then refine. So if you feel taken, you know, take a, second and then think about, okay, what is, what are all the benefits I've gained? And then what are some of the things that I don't like? And then at that three month mark, then decide, do I want to keep going? And at at that point, you know, it was great that you had a coach that, you know, kind of motivated you to keep going because you did see some benefits, right? You saw some healing in your eczema, you saw some healing with your blood pressure. And so it maybe took a little bit of that support to keep you going. And now you have all these benefits, right? And you're becoming an advocate for a meat based diet, because you've seen the your own healing. Um, Would you say that having that support is so important? um, While you're first starting? Absolutely, I think. And if I may say this, I mean, I got my coach through meat RX, Mm -hmm. because you can get a 30 minute session for $17.88. And that's affordable. And I have a great coach, Sarah Hill, she's um, uh, older, She's not as old as I am. Most people aren't, (laughs) but uh, she's older and she's a nutritionist and uh, she has just been fabulous. That's amazing. She's really been great. And, you know, I didn't have to sign a contract or anything. I can just set up an appointment with her whenever I feel like I need to talk to her. We just had a long coaching session yesterday. And uh, I think that's really, really important because even though I watched a lot of videos, I, of course, I've read your book, which I have to put in a plug for your book. <laughs> I've read so many books in the last 40 years and, and videos and blogs. And I was so impressed with your book. It just, it really, it's a great reference book. Thank you. And it covers everything. I don't think you left a stone unturned. It's just an excellent book. Everybody should have it, whether they're going to do carnivore or not, because you're going to learn so much about uh, everything that has to do with nutrition. Thank you. So uh, I read your book that really helped me, but it really helped to talk to Sarah, to be able to ask all the questions. You know, I had, cons- I would get concerns and I wasn't really sure which way to go. And uh, she's just been a really big help to me and, and it's very affordable. Yes. So I would definitely recommend that people get a coach if at all possible. Yeah. It's interesting. So one, I've met many of the Meet RX coaches, and I think some of them are wonderful. Um, I have a friend that's a Meet RX coach too. And so I always say that when you're first starting carnivore and you're not really sure because there is more players in the space. And so there's a lot of confusion. Do I eat beef, uh, liver? Do I eat nose to tail? Do I eat um, organic, right? So there's a lot. And so now when you come in, it's a lot more complicated than it used to be a few years ago. And so doing the Meet RX coaching, it's really good especially when you're just starting out and you need a little extra support, the community aspect of it is great, right? So if you are just doing this alone and your immediate community is so anti-carnivore, which most people are, then it's great to have that. And then if you're 
like six months in and you're still really sick, that's when people that are, you know, like someone like me would be a bigger support, but you don't need a person like me when you first start. Like no one starts with me when they're month one into carnivore. That's never my clientele. It's normally six months, a year in, and they're still not sleeping well, um, loose stool still, you know, that type of thing. So in the interim, I think the meet RX coaches are really good. And like you said, there's even nutritionists, Sean Baker's a great guy. So all of these people it's to support. I mean, ultimately they're doing it to help other people. And so I think it's yes. great. I think it's really smart. Um, I've joined some of the community calls. I did one with their gut digestion group and I love them. They're it's, it's, it's such a great, and like you said, affordable way to get support and, you know, I think that's really important than trying to do this by yourself and just trying to watch YouTube videos because even YouTube videos, we're all different and we might all say different things, right? I may say something about fat one day and then Kim Barry might say something different. You know what I mean? About like the protein consumption. And so that's where when you get coaching one-on-one, you get what you need specifically. And I think that's so important. So I'm glad you shared. I'm glad you shared that you did. Yeah, I, I would recommend that. And just to answer your question about older people doing carnivore, is it different? I mean, you know, I haven't done any scientific studies on this or set up my own study to do, but just from listening to all of the anecdotal testimonies and the books and everything I've read, I would say, yes, I think it is different for older people. I think, especially for someone like me who has, you know, been on every type of diet and, you know, the feast or famine and, Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, I just did a lot of things to my body that I was hurting it and I didn't even know. So I think it's a good idea uh, to start slow. I think that's really important. And especially most people my age are, they don't pay much attention to nutrition. You know, they, they go to, they go out to eat most of the time. So if you're eating like that and you decide you want to try to do carnivore, I think you should ease into it. I really do. You know, if, especially if you're eating the standard American diet. I mean, when I started getting off of that, I did it one step at a time. You know, I got off the Diet Cokes and then I got off of the chocolate, which I didn't think was even possible. And then I totally eliminated the sugar, which was really hard. And uh, then, the, I, then the gluten, I mean, I just started letting go of things over a period of, a year or so. And uh, I'm not saying you should take a year or so to do that, but give yourself time, your body time to adjust because it is a shock to your body. And when you're older, your body is functioning differently than it did when you were younger. I mean, that's just, our bodies are wearing out, you know? And if my thing is not quantity, it's quality. You know, I don't know how long I'm going to live, but while I'm here, I want to have a very full active life. And that is totally possible when you're old and I am old. I mean, when you're 78, you have hit old. <laughs> now I don't feel old and I don't act old, but the truth of the matter is I am. And, but I want to be alive and happy and, and, you know, have a full active life. And uh, I don't want to be in a nursing home. And I think it's very possible to do that. Even if you start later in life. But, uh, but I think you should approach it gradually and let the healing do its thing and let it take care. It's taking, I feel like it's taking me longer than uh, I had anticipated. I usually have pretty high expectations. So I would love to just get out of bed every morning and feel like I could leap tall buildings, but that doesn't happen every day. And uh, I just recently retired. I mean, I, I reached the point where I realized I need to let go of this now and just uh, start pacing myself differently. So, um, yeah. So one, you do not look nearly 70. I would guess like young sixties, if anything. So wow, thank fabulous. you. yeah, you look fabulous. I, I knew you were in the seventies just because we talked, but I really thought maybe I forgot, but I thought you were maybe, so I just assumed, okay, just looking at you, I said, okay, maybe she's 70. So yes, you look great. So one, um, and there's a lot of studies with Alzheimer's. Um, yes, some of it can be genetic, but then some of it is just 
like they say it's type three diabetes. And so if you are eating meat based, then the chances of that manifesting are much, much less. And so you're doing the right things to live a long time. And I agree with you, it may take longer. My mom was diabetic and she was diabetic probably all her 40s, 50s. I'm not exactly sure when she was diagnosed, but she started doing carnivore-ish keto um, probably early or to mid 60s. And her keto flu, even though she took like the keto supplements and the electrolytes, it was bad. And it was because she was diabetic. And so for her, she slept for a good two weeks of um, while she was healing. And so, yeah, I, I think it makes a lot of sense that it may just take a little bit longer. And I think it also depends on, you know, your history. I, I think it's so important that you have from what I'm hearing from you, you worked on a lot of the mental aspect of your relationship with food, because I, that's one other thing I notice is a lot of people come to carnivore and they're like, this is it. This is what's going to make me lose weight. And I can almost, um, kind of live with my eating disorder and just let it be healthier. But I really think we also need to work on our relationship with food, which it sounds like you have, do you have any insight for the people that are watching this? Yes. (laughs) 